Aloha! In this video, we discuss strong versus weak bases. Let's recall that bases increase hydroxide concentrations in water. And like acids, bases can also be divided into strong and weak categories. A strong base is fairly easy to identify. It is a soluble metal hydroxide. Metal hydroxides are usually insoluble, but the soluble ones, we call those the strong bases. Take the alkali metal hydroxides, for instance, uh, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium hydroxide. I'll, I'll remind you that uh, the alkali metals are in uh, group one of the periodic table. So uh, here they are right there and, you know, lithium, sodium, potassium, and on. So those are the alkali metal hydroxides. Now these are, uh, are, are very soluble in water. So these are all strong bases right here. The most common ones are sodium and potassium hydroxide. In fact, if someone says they have a strong base, they're usually talking about one of these two. Let's look at potassium hydroxide quickly. And now in pure form, it is a solid, but when you put it in contact with water, it does dissolve as an aqueous solution. And like all ionic compounds do, when they're dissolved in water, they are dissociated into their cations and anions. In this case, the anion happens to be a hydroxide. So really a strong base is just an ionic compound that dissolves in water where the anion is a hydroxide. In other words, it's a soluble metal hydroxide. If you wanna visualize potassium hydroxide in solution, uh, it will be fully dissociated. All of the potassium pluses will be separated from the hydroxide minuses. Now there are some other soluble metal hydroxides, uh, just a few others, um, you know, most are insoluble, uh, but in the alkaline earth column, uh, I'll remind you where that is, uh, that's next to the alkali metals. So alkali metals is group one, and alkaline earth metals are group two. The lower alkaline earth metals are, uh, you know, more soluble than the higher ones. Their hydroxides are more soluble than those up here. So uh, that's a strontium and barium. So when you're looking at magnesium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, strontium and barium hydroxide, strontium and barium are more soluble. You get more soluble as you go down the column. Now, why is that? Why are those lower hydroxides more soluble than the upper hydroxides? A couple of uh, reasons you could think about. Uh, one would be the electronegativity of the metal atoms decrease as you go down the periodic table. So here's a little uh, you know, chart of the electronegativities of the atoms. And you can see as you go down, the electronegativity decreases. So they, uh, what, what that means is, is these atoms are pulling negative charge less than those atoms. When you're less electronegative, you don't want the negative charge as much as when you're more electronegative. And so hydroxides being negative, uh, you know, the more electronegative magnesium uh, is pulling the negative hydroxides closer to it than the less electronegative barium. So it's easier for the hydroxides to get away from barium than it is uh, for magnesium. And so strontium and barium are more soluble uh, than uh, magnesium and calcium. Though I have seen people call magnesium and calcium hydroxide strong bases because, uh, you know, especially calcium, it's slightly soluble in water. But uh, these are very soluble in water. Now, another way to, uh, to justify the, the greater solubility as you go down the column is um, you know, barium atoms are very big and magnesium atoms are very small. Remember, uh, you know, atoms get bigger as you go down the periodic table. And if you have a very large barium ion, uh, then hydroxide ions cannot get too close to it because you know, the, the metal ion is so big. 
And so the farther away the negative hydroxide is from the, the positive ion, the, the less attracted it is to it. And so larger metal ions uh, don't attract hydroxides as great as smaller metal ions. A, a, a plus two magnesium ion, the hydroxides can get really close to it and therefore they don't want to leave. So that's another way to look at it. Uh, let's look at strontium hydroxide for uh, an example. Uh, notice that the, uh, the formula is strontium with two hydroxides. So it has the ability to release two of them. So it is a solid in its pure form, but when you put it in contact with water, it does dissolve as an aqueous solution. And again, like all ionic compounds do when they're dissolved, they, they fully dissociate. So this in solution exists as the strontium plus two ions and the two hydroxide minus ions. So, you know, you get two hydroxides per formula unit. So in that respect, uh, these right here, since they give you two hydroxides per formula unit, you might say that they're, you know, more powerful uh, than those right there. So that's kind of interesting. Let's calculate the pH of a, a strontium hydroxide solution, just to, to throw you a little tough one here. Um, so here is an example. Find the pH if 522 milligrams of strontium hydroxide solid dissolves in enough water to make 25 milliliters of solution. Let's find the pH of that. If, if you remember the last video, to get to the pH, you could first determine the pOH. So you know that the pH plus the pOH has to equal 14. So when you're dealing with bases, it's usually easier to figure out what the pOH is because after all, bases tell you about hydroxides. So uh, first, let's find the hydroxide concentration. Um, you know, a strontium hydroxide fully dissolves and dissociates into hydroxide ions. So let's find that hydroxide molarity. So let's take our mass of strontium hydroxide, 522 milligrams, convert that to grams. And using the molar mass of strontium hydroxide, if you add up strontium and, and the oc two oxygens and the two hydrogens, you get 121.63 grams. So convert milligrams to grams and grams to moles. Now, this would be moles of strontium hydroxide. So don't forget that one mole of strontium hydroxide produces two moles of hydroxide ions. So upstairs, that's the moles of hydroxide ions. We divide that by the liter of solution. So 25 milliliters of solution converted to liters. That's the liters of solution. And so moles of hydroxides over liters of solution and running that calculation, you get 0.34 molarity of hydroxide. It's a lot of hydroxide. So now that we know the hydroxide concentration, we can calculate the pOH. It's a negative log of the hydroxide concentration comes out to 0.46. So the pH is whatever you add to this to get 14. So the pH, uh, comes out to uh, 13.54. So that's a very basic solution. Remember the pH scale ranges from one about, which is very acidic, up to about 14, which is very basic. So this is getting uh, up near 14, very basic solution. So that was an example of a, a tough problem for a strong base. Uh, usually strong bases, you know, are going to be um, sodium and potassium and and those are a little simpler to deal with because they only give you one hydroxide per formula unit. I decided to give you a tough problem so I don't want to cheat you guys. So anyway that's a strong base so let's do a weak base. Now weak bases also increase hydroxide concentration in water but they do it through a different mechanism. The way a weak base works is it gives you a hydroxide ion by accepting a proton from water. For example, ammonia is a weak base, 
NH3, and it dissolves in water. Um, so there is no hydroxide in the ammonia molecule itself, but this is a weak base, and weak bases accept protons. And so when this is an aqueous solution, um, it's surrounded by water molecules, and it has the ability to take a proton from one of those water molecules. And if it does, uh, that leaves the hydroxide ion. You know, once water loses a proton, it turns into hydroxide. And once ammonia gains the proton, it turns into its conjugate acid form, ammonium ion. Now, not all ammonia molecules do that, a small fraction of them, you know, and um, if you want to visualize what a solution of ammonia looks like, you might have a couple of hydroxide ions and ammonium cations, uh, maybe about one out of every 75 ammonia molecules does that. And it's an equilibrium that's occurring between uh, the molecules and the ions. So this is an equilibrium chemical equation uh, as acknowledged by the two-way arrow here. So like all equilibrium chemical equations, we can uh, find the equilibrium constant for it. And the equilibrium constant for this uh, chemical reaction is uh, 1.76 times 10 to the minus 5. This time we call it Kb because uh, we're talking about what a base does here. So let's, um, let's uh, find the pH of uh, an ammonia solution. So it's a little, a little more involved than a strong base. So a weak base, uh, you're gonna have to do an ice diagram. So for example, let's find the pH of 0.1 molarity ammonia at 25 Celsius. Now again, ammonia establishes this equilibrium in aqueous solution. And if you begin with 0.1 molarity of ammonia, and you know, it doesn't say anything about hydroxide or ammonium, so we say that there is zero. But you should acknowledge that water does, of course, provide background hydroxide concentration of uh, 10 to the minus seven molarity. Now, it is tiny amount of hydroxide, and it can usually be ignored. Um, we're gonna take it into account this time and, and see you know, if it really could have been ignored or not. So let's just uh, keep it there. Keep that 10 to the minus seven molarity there. That's what water provides at, at the beginning. So to get to equilibrium, if you begin with 0.1 molarity of ammonia, uh, it's gonna lose X amount and the products will therefore gain X amount here and X amount there. So at equilibrium, you got 0.1 minus X for the ammonia and then 10 to the minus seven plus X for the hydroxide and then X for the ammonium. Now this equilibrium uh, has the corresponding equilibrium constant expression, the product concentrations over the reactant concentration. And you take these equilibrium concentrations, you substitute them in right here. You take that equilibrium constant Kb that we, we saw a second ago, the 1.76 times 10 to the minus five and you substitute it in right there. And so everything's been plugged in and this is what you're dealing with over here. So plugging everything in, uh, it's a nasty looking equation that you have to solve for x. So you see that 10 to the minus seven plus x upstairs, that's from right there. So we're including the autoionization of water here. Now this is tough to solve, uh, so take your time, do it carefully. And uh, if you do, you'll get x equals 0.0013. So well, here's the extra digits, but it's significant up to 0 0.0013. Okay, so X is 0 0.0013. To get the hydroxide concentration at equilibrium, you have to add 10 to the minus seven to X. But remember 10 to the minus seven is 0 0.0000001. Okay, it'd be way down there. And if you're adding that to 0 0.0013, it's like you're adding nothing. Okay, so, uh, you know, what sig fig addition rules, um, you know, you still left with 0 0.0013. I just kept a couple digits here, uh, but you know, the answer is uh, the hydroxide concentration would round to 0 0.0013. Okay, now that we have the hydroxide concentration, 
the pOH can be calculated as negative log of hydroxide concentration, and that comes out to be 2.88. And so the pH would be 14 minus 2.88, which comes out to 11.12. So that's somewhat basic. Uh, not up near 14 like strong base would give, but you know, it's, uh, it's greater than seven. So it's in the basic region, in the weak base region. Now what ha would have happened if we would have ignored the auto ionization of water? So if instead of saying that the hydroxide concentration is 10 to the minus seven at the beginning, what would have happened if we would have just said it was zero? And so down here, that would have been uh, X. If you would have ignored that 10 to the minus seven down there, you know, you'd just be left with X. Then this would be the equation that you're solving. And uh, you know, it's easier to solve. Uh, and you solve for X and you get 0 0.0013. So uh, it, it, you know, you get the same answer. So you can see here that um, we should have ignored the auto ionization of uh, water. This would have been the easier equation to solve than that one. Um, and we could have just done it this way, calculated the pOH, gotten the same answer and the same pH. Now, if we could have ignored the auto ionization of water here, and it, it seems like we usually do ignore auto ionization of water, that begs the question, um, does it ever need to be taken into account? Does auto ionization ever need to be taken into account? And the answer is yes. If the base is very dilute, um, or and or if the base is very weak, then the hydroxide concentration would compare with that of water. Let's clarify what that means. Water provides a tiny bit of background hydroxide concentration, 10 to the minus seven molarity. Well, imagine you have a really, really, really weak base, and on top of that, it's very, very, very dilute, then its hydroxide concentration might be comparable with water's. And in that case, you wouldn't want to ignore water's hydroxide concentration. It, it would be comparable with what the weak, weak, weak base would contribute. So, uh, you know, the same goes for acids. Um, you know, if you, you can't ignore the auto ionization of water, you can't ignore that background proton concentration if the acid itself is very, very, very weak and very, very, very dilute. In that case, it would have to be taken into account. So uh, let's see an example of a case where it does need to be taken into account. So here's a problem, uh, the last one in the video. Let's find the pH of the solution formed by dissolving 100 milligrams, that's not very much, 100 milligrams of aniline. Uh, here is aniline right there, it's a weak base. So you dissolve 100 milligrams of aniline, this is its Kb, in 1.5 liters of solution. So 100 milligrams is not that much, that's 0.1 gram and so it's going to be very dilute. And on top of that, look at the equilibrium constant. It's 10 to the minus 10. So very small equilibrium constant. There are not going to be very many product hydroxides at equilibrium. And on top of that, it's very dilute. So you're not going to get that much that way either by its concentration. So uh, let, let's see that um, uh, we do have to include the auto ionization of water this time. First, let's find the molarity of the aniline that we start with, the initial base concentration. So take the 100 milligrams of aniline, convert it to grams, and convert grams to moles using the molar mass of aniline. So that's the moles of aniline, and let's divide that by the liters of solution to get the molarity of aniline that we begin with. And look at the molarity, it's 0.00071 molarity of aniline. So here is the chemical equation for what the weak base aniline does in water. It accepts a proton to produce hydroxide in the protonated aniline. And at the very beginning, the initial concentration of aniline is tiny, 0.00071. Okay, and uh, 
the hydroxide concentration, um, we'll do it both ways. We'll, we'll ignore it and then we'll also say that uh, it's, you know, it has a little bit due to the autoionization of water, 10 to the minus seven molarity. Uh, there's no protonated aniline though. So to get to equilibrium, we lose X amount of aniline, the reactant, uh, and we gain X amount of products. And so at equilibrium here are the concentrations involving X. Now hydroxide, uh, we're gonna do it both ways, uh, just being X and then being 10 to the minus seven plus X. So we'll do the calculation both ways. First, let's ignore auto ionization of water. So we'll just say that it's X. And so the equation that we're solving is X squared. It's this equation right here. It's, it's kind of nasty. Uh, solving for X, you get um, 5.28 times 10 to the minus seven. Okay, you see I've drawn an X through it. But if you include the auto ionization of water 10 to the minus seven, okay, then the equation we're solving, if, if you plug everything in, I forgot to mention, you have to plug these equilibrium concentrations into the equilibrium constant expression right there. So put the KB and, and the concentrations and you plug everything in. This time, that's the nasty expression you have, even nastier. So solving for X this time, it comes out to be 4.8 times 10 to the minus seven. Now we have to add X to the 10 to the minus seven. Don't forget to do that because we're including the 10 to the minus seven this time. And so hydroxide concentration is 10 to the minus seven plus that 4.8 times 10 to the minus seven. And uh, 10 to the minus seven is same thing as one times 10 to the minus seven. So you have one times 10 to the minus seven plus 4.81 10 to the minus seven. That's 5.81 10 to the minus seven. And so uh, you can see the hydroxide concentration this time is 5.8 times 10 to the minus seven. Compare that with what we have up here, 5.3 times 10 to the minus seven. So that's significantly different. It's different enough that you know we, we should say that they're not the same. So uh, you know don't do the approximation if the answers are going to be going to be different. So this is the better answer here. That's the hydroxide concentration, and let's use it to calculate the pOH, which comes out to 6.24, and therefore the pH is 7.76. So very slightly basic. Okay, it's just above seven. It's barely in the basic region. That's because our base is really weak and it's very dilute. So very weak base. Now that was a pretty tough problem. The good news is um, you normally don't have to do that, okay? The auto ionization of water can usually be ignored 95% of the time. Just be on the lookout. File it in the back of your brain somewhere that, you know, there are cases where you have to take it into account, okay? But you're probably not going to see many of them. So in our next video, we'll discuss a couple of other approximation techniques. So this time we did the auto ionization of water, ignoring that and justifying that. Um, next time we'll discuss the X is small and the method of successive approximation. So these are pretty cool and, and these should actually help you out, make your um, problems, you know, solving uh, faster. Okay. Uh, so anyway, so approximation techniques next time. Stay tuned for that. Aloha.